everyone. Welcome everyone. My name is Michelle Thatcher. I'm the CEO and co-founder of the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce, and um, we. I'm going to pass it over to Hadley Wilman, who is the director for the University Climate Ambassadors, among many other roles. Yes, thank you, Michelle, and thank you everyone for being here on this Monday afternoon or evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Hadley Wilman, and I'm the director for the University Climate Ambassador Program, which is at the Global Climate Pledge and the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce. So we have three things going on there. And today I'm pleased to welcome you to this webinar, Equipping Students to be Sustainability Leaders in the Workplace. And we are being joined here by Dr. Aurora Don Benton. So please welcome her today, and I'm turning it over to you now. Thank you so much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone about how students can be sustainability leaders in the workplace, either while they are in college or immediately after. So first off, um, a little bit about my background. I have sort of a varied career. I started off in with a bachelor's in computer information systems, worked in tech for a bit when got my master's degree, then moved in sort of marketing and project management and product management in the tech space, worked predominantly with retail um, and financial services industries, and had a, a bit of a volatile career because I worked in a lot of startups and I worked in industries that faced a lot of turmoil. So I was working in the tech industry when the tech bubble burst and, and just before 9-11. And then I was working in the financial services industry when the housing crash happened in 2008. So uh, it, it caused me to do a lot of soul searching at each you know juncture and, and re sort of reinvent myself. So I've reinvented myself several times and and I would say that that now I'm in my lane. <laughs> I'm really doing something I absolutely love, but continuing to evolve. So after I was in financial services, the next uh, career that I had was in higher education. And I'd always been told, you know, oh, you'd be a great teacher because I'm a you know, good speaker, good communicator, do a lot of presentations in the companies I worked for. And so I thought, well, let me give this a try, you know, and I, I, started adjuncting and then I became a full-time person at a um, a small school in Chicago that had both uh, was predominantly culinary and hospitality but also had a business program so I ran the business program for a few years and then I sort of went on to the corporate level because this was a for-profit organization I went on to the corporate level and was helping them roll out online education in their their schools in Europe and then in 2016, in early 2016, they sold that division to a European investor and eliminated all the U.S. jobs. So once again, I found myself in this place of like, okay, now what? And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. When it comes to um, experiential learning, I, I, from the very beginning, like, you know, I didn't grow up, as you will, in higher education. So when I got into higher education, um, I, I just did what made sense to me, like, and what made sense to me was like one of the first classes I taught was a marketing class, and I gave the students the assignment that they had to go out and work with a real world company, whether it could be one of their, like, where they worked or whatever, and they had to do like a marketing plan, because that's just like, how else would you learn? You got to learn by doing, right? And so um, I started really, really doing that. But when I was first doing this 15 years ago, it, it, now you hear about experiential learning a lot and a lot more universities and a lot more professors have really integrated this approach into their coursework. But 15 years ago, this was really pushing the envelope. Um, and even today, it's probably not as mainstream as it needs to be. And one of the reasons, just so you kind of understand the perspective of why it's not more mainstream, it's difficult to pull off because for me to do some of the, the experiences I ended up doing, I either have to trust that students can go out and find their own experiential learning, which in some cases I've done, and that's a lot of what we'll talk about today, or I have to find it for them. And that can be very difficult to do, um, especially if you don't work for a really mainstream large university with a lot of resources and attention that you can pull from. Um, it can be really difficult. 
Uh, and then the challenge with experiential learning, learning by doing, if you will, is that the experiences can really kind of vary widely, right? Because if I go out, like I used to do this one course where I would recruit four or five companies, usually really small businesses local to Chicago, and then I would divide students up into teams of four or five, and they had to sort of do a consulting project for that company during the course of their um, their term. And sometimes you would have the companies would be great and they would mentor the students and be available. And then other times they would totally ghost the student team and it would just be a disaster. And I would step in and kind of, you know, do my best to recover the situation. And in academics, <laughs> that's not exactly what you're going for. A lot of the the expectations and accreditation and everything around academics still expect a lot of uniformity. So it's very hard to demonstrate that, that there is success or that students have achieved the desired outcomes in this kind of situation. So um, that I, I give that background because what I'm gonna describe today is very much an experiential learning thing. And it's very much what I think every university should be offering. And I think sustainability and the approach I'm going to talk about today is one of the best ways that you can give students experiential learning and that it's not just about sustainability. It's going to cover a gamut of things. And, and I'll sort of tie a bow on that at the very end uh, with a little story about one of my former students. Now, my own personal journey, a lot of where this comes from is my own journey and how I sort of changed my career each time, but even more so when I got into sustainability, as I mentioned earlier, I was laid off from a company and was suddenly like, uh, what do I do? Well, it goes back further than that. Starting about probably 20, 25 years ago, I began to get very, very interested in the concept of social enterprise, using business to solve social problems. So not just philanthropy or, you know, like a United Way fundraising kind of thing, but but really like teaching, um, you know, people who are recovering from addiction, um, recovering from um, abuse of any kind or have other barriers to employment and being able to teach those people skills while they produce a, a valuable product that has, you know, that can be sold in a marketplace. And so uh, I just thought that's really cool. Uh, I would, I was part of a, you know, when I would be back part of a church and, and there would be volunteer groups and they would go and, you know, work with kids or plant a garden. And I was like, I don't like kids and I don't have a great time. I don't really want to do these things. I'm good at business. I'm good at strategy. I'm good at marketing. I'm good at project management. How can I use my gifts and talents in a way that benefits the world? And that's where I really started to, to catch on to this idea of social enterprise. And then around the time that I was, um, and then I also, I, that's what I have my, basically what I have my doctorate in as well. And then around the time I was I was let go of this company and, and had to kind of rethink what I wanted to do next, I started really diving into the environmental side. And that just opened up a whole new side and a new world for me. And of course, because I came from the social side, I began to see the interplay of both the social and environmental and became extremely interested in it. Now, the way I, dive, I dove into that environmental side is that I signed up for every webinar, a webinar. I attended every networking event. At the time, I was living in the Maryland, D.C. area. I attended everything I could possibly attend. I got my lead green associate. I got a, a certificate from the Green Furnishing Council. I got, I did, I went after everything. I did everything I possibly could to sort of stack my resume and, and to learn. Um, I also volunteered for, so there's like the International Society of Sustainability Professionals. I volunteered and, and just really showed up and did as much as I could to help run events or to help them develop materials and content. And so just really building my network through that, as well as building my confidence and my knowledge. And so I was pretty much deciding that this is the career I wanted. But at the time, even though I was in my 40s, I was 46 at the time. And I, I but I was experiencing something that even those of you who are, you know, 26 or, you know, around that age might be experiencing, which is I felt I don't have the resume to do what I want to do. 
I've decided I want to draw a line in the sand and moving forward, I only want to work in corporate responsibility and sustainability. But I don't have, ex I don't have actual experience. I've got a doctorate. I've taught some classes, but I'm not exactly going to get the position that someone of my experience and age deserves, like director VP level of sustainability with the resume that I have. And so I kind of started asking myself, well, I could go out and get a job or I could start a business. They are both painfully difficult things to do. And so I figured, why don't I start a business? And if along the way, I impress someone and get a job, then great. But that was over six years ago, and I started a Strapdo, and I'm still going strong with a Strapdo. Uh, the COVID aside, different story. You'll understand in a moment why that was rather devastating to me. But here I am um, uh, back and thriving. And a Strapdo means to illuminate, and the our mission is to shed light on social and environmental issues in hospitality events and, the tra and travel, which of course is, is why COVID was pretty devastating to my business because all my clients were shut down. So therefore uh, I was as well. But um, let me just walk you a little bit more through this, this journey of starting a company so that you can think about how you yourself could go down the same route, whether it leads to getting a job or maybe even starting your own business, depending on what point in your career is. So basically the steps to go from zero to hero, because I started really at zero. I didn't have the experience. So first of all, I had to believe. I had to believe I could do it. And, and that can be really hard to do, but I had to believe that I could do it. And I had to really like, really hold on and, and really be tenacious. Another critical thing that you have to do is you have to really identify what it is. And a lot of times the it to everyone is sustainability. It, it, it is environmental science, but that is not what it is. Your job and what you are doing, the it you bring into the world is salesmanship, project management, relationship building, problem solving. It's all those soft, all the soft skills they love to talk about in the university that that and this is why experiential learning is so important because it teaches professionalism it teaches you to actually have the confidence to go in and, and do these things and it helps you understand that what you really are doing in the world is all of these soft skill things and i knew at that point in my career that i had a lot of it right i had done marketing communications project management product management program management academic management uh, stakeholder engagement i had done all the things you need to do to do sustainability i just had not done it in the context of sustainability but i knew that i could I also asked around and asked some other uh, consultants, you know, should I be kind of like just whatever and focus on whatever, or should I pick an industry or pick sort of like a, a specific part of sustainability? And they all said, focus. They, especially those who were generalists, they wish they could go back again and focus. And don't worry if you start out with a focus and you feel like you're going to get locked in for life. That's not true. Life will take you in all kinds of directions, but if you can start off with focus, it allows you to focus your efforts, focus your research, focus your networking, focus your energy. And then what I did, which again, I was inspired by my own experience, having my students go out and you know basically do free work for companies, is I started out by offering to do some things for free. And, it, and when I was first doing that, I felt like I needed to justify that. Like I needed to kind of defend it or explain it. And, and then I realized like, wait a minute, I know what entrepreneurship really means. And I need to just basically like own it. No one needs to know how much I was paid or not paid. I make a lot, I make good money now, a lot more than zero, but people still don't know how much I make. It's nobody's business. And so I went out and did things for free and, and just had to let go of this like sort of shame or guilt or whatever. But I went out and offered to, to do some of the projects for free. And as I would do these projects, I would really, you know, grow in my knowledge and confidence. And one of the things that made it easy for me to ask is I was doing an online course. Remember earlier I said I was taking all these online courses. So I would go into a hotel and say, hey, I'm taking this course and I have an assignment to do this. Can I do this assignment on your business? 
And it, and of course, at that point, like they're less suspicious. It's it's harder for them to reject. And so this is another beauty of experiential learning is when you're doing an assignment, people like, oh, I want to help you, young student. Do you, you know, learn your thing here? Um, I also would recommend that you consider the phrase fake it till you make it because it's a little scary to act like you know what you're talking about and not really be sure. But sometimes, yeah, and I'm not talking about being deceptive or fraudulent or anything like that. Don't put things on your resume that aren't true. But sometimes you can sell yourself as a professional and then sort of fake your way through the, the technical pieces and the problem solving. And, and of course, the more experienced you are in a variety of disciplines, the more you'll be able to fake your way through things. And so um, it's amazing how far I've gotten by starting out with sort of a fake it till you make it. I've had new, you know, I'll get new clients that I haven't had in a, in a new arena of, of hospitality, travel and, and tourism and events. And, and be like, oh, I can do that, sure. Um, and I mean, if they ask me, have you done this before? I can say, well, I've done this like this. I've done this over here and I've done this thing. Have I worked with an, a company exactly like yours? No, I haven't, but I've done all the things that you want me to do. And then, and then now I get to add that to my resume. And then again, uh, sort of like with the focus and the identify what it is, you need to be specific about how you can help. I find that all too often, especially young people who are getting started and want to be in sustainability, they've just brushed this very broad stroke about wanting to be in sustainability. And, and you're making other people do the work for you. So you really need to in, invest, investigate what the careers are, what the titles are, what the roles are, and be able to draw more of a boundary around, around what it is you're asking. Because if you're going in sort of like, um, you know, I'd like a job in sustainability, won't you help me? Like people are not likely to respond to you. If you're networking through LinkedIn and you're sending sort of generic general questions uh, you know, to people, no one's going to answer you. You need to be extremely specific. And that is one way you can carve out the things you don't want to do is by kind of narrowing on some of that specificity. Okay, so from hero to, from zero to hero, I was named one of the top 30 champions of environmental sustainability and hospitality and tourism in 2021. And a dear friend of mine who has this company that helps, he uh, basically coaches and mentors sustainability professionals. And he does these sort of little icons. And I was the first um, non-employee of his company that he did. He calls everyone a change maker, but I'm the OG change maker. So I will own these things. And I'm very proud of, of the work that I've done. So when I was first starting out, I really wanted to help service industry pr practitioners, like people like that are working at hotel properties and people on the front line, not the executive suite. I'm more drawn to the people who are doing the work. And so what I realized is that they, uh, you know, I was going around all these hotels, especially, and they didn't really have green teams. And it seemed like, well, that's kind of an easy thing to do. I mean, it's just a, putting together a team, right? And so I thought, well, what if I built like a template that they could follow that was just very basic, you know, kind of like step by step, because even though it seems easy to me, for some reason, they're not doing it. So how can I build it flexible enough, like, like, like structured enough that they can put together a team, but flexible enough so that at this property, they might focus on water reduction and that property that might focus on, um, you know, energy and this property, it might be food sourcing or different things like that. It had to be extremely practical. I realized pretty quickly in this world that going in and saying like, I can do whatever you need me to do, kind of consulting, there was no price tag to that. There was no boundaries around that. So I needed to go in and say, this is what I sell you. This is how much it costs. And, and if they didn't want that, usually at least opened a door to, to more conversations, but it had to be practical. Um, I, of course, talked about sustainability. I gave like some general information, like here's some case studies and, you know, um, but really focusing on data, really, really focusing on the business case. I outlined sort of these four quadrants on here, are the various uh, categories of business cases and really focused everything I built around building that business case, really speaking the language of business. 
And then I also, like I said, I designed this more for like a mid or lower level manager, not the executives. And what I was really trying to do was bridge the gap between the, the big picture corporate level stuff and what's happening on the ground. So in the hotel world, you know, most of the hotels are Marriott's, Hilton's, Hyatt's, Accor, et cetera. And you can go on any of their websites and read all these cool things they're doing. But there's been a pretty big recognition that there's kind of a gap between what the corporate says and what's done on the property. And, and that's no, there's no one really to blame. A lot of that just has to do with the way the hotel industry is structured. But the same can be said for almost any global brand. You go on the website and read what they're doing, but you're looking around your office going, um, wait, I don't see that here. And so corporate, the corporate is miles away and, and often out of touch. And there's not enough ground level support for implementation. So uh, I would assign my students to go and look into what their companies are doing. And so often I would, I would hear them say, oh, on the red website, I read this or in their sustainability report, I read that. But we don't do that at this property. We don't do that here. I've never seen that. Oh, I never knew we even did that. I heard that sort of stuff so often. So to me, I thought a green team is the local application and implementation of corporate strategy, right? You've got these people at the corporate level who are super smart, amazing, strategic people. They put together these plans and poor things, they're, they're, they're so limited in their resources to be able to roll that out. Now, I will say, coming out of the pandemic, all of these brands have been investing, and even right before the pandemic, they have been, in, have been investing big time in growing these departments. The number of positions, even just Marriott has added in sustainability in recent years is just, it's, a, it's amazing. And so I'll give a lot of credit to the fact that they're starting to finally, you know, have some, some, um, uh, the, some meat on those bones. So the, the, the course that I developed was to, again, to address green teams because contrary to popular belief, they're not popular. I was like, agree, you know, you hear kind of like, oh yeah, green teams. I mean, everybody's kind of done that. Aren't we kind of done with that? Like, it's not a one and done thing. And in fact, a recent green lodging trends report from 2022 showed that less than one fifth of hotels across the board have a sustainability team. And if you look at the top 10 countries, the United States doesn't even register, right? And this is, again, this is hotels across a, you know, a wide variety of types of hotels. But this whole idea of like, oh yeah, everybody's doing a green team. Isn't that just a thing we do? No, it's not a thing that most people do. And it's a thing that everybody should be doing. So what tends to happen is that the green team, when somebody does finally say, well, let's, we've got to have a green team here, like maybe because the corporate mandated it, it's the last few minutes of another meeting so that you can check the box. There's a lot of turnover. So they fizzle out and then don't restart because it's usually all on the shoulders of one key champion. Um, the team doesn't usually have a lot of authority or a lot of budget. And then a lot of times the person who's assigned to run the green team is not really a person who's necessarily a people person or necessarily someone who wants to do that part of the work. They might be great rolling up their sleeves and installing new systems or new toilets, but they don't necessarily want to have to walk around and be friendly with other departments and then hold a meeting and socialize, right? And so there were a variety of problems that I felt like I could address. And so um, the guiding principle behind all of this is a green team is a pretty basic thing, but yet we're not doing it. So better a mediocre idea with brilliant execution than a brilliant idea with mediocre execution. A green team is not a brilliant idea. It's kind of a no duh, but yet it's, it's so poorly executed. So let's take this mediocre idea, a green team, and let's do what we can to make it brilliant. So I created this course, I tested it out on the market, I found some different hotels that were willing to go through the, 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 the process. These were hotels that were verified already sustainable through the Rainforest Alliance, so they already kind of had a, a good program going, but even with that, they needed help, they needed structure. 
Uh, and then I was at a conference in Chile. Remember I said I signed up to everything I could possibly go to. I went to a Global Sustainable Tourism Council uh, conference in Chile, and I met uh, Diana. And I want Diana to talk to you for just a moment. Hello, students. It is my pleasure to share with you my story and how I got started in this space of sustainability. Not too long ago, about 20 years, I found myself in your shoes. I found a calling to make a difference in my area of control in this new trend everybody was talking about, sustainability. But for me, it wasn't a trend. It was a calling, and I knew that I had to do something right after I took my first course in sustainability, specifically targeted for sustainable tourism. I, at the time, was a brand desk agent at a hotel. I went up to my GM and said, I want to do something that is going to help us be more environmentally friendly, be more efficient, be more conscious. And it's also just going to be something fun for different in departments to do together. I want to start a green team. I wasn't exactly sure how or what, just a little information that I obtained from that one class, which was very broad on sustainable tourism. I was able to gather that I needed to have very good uh, understanding of the topic of environmental impact. I needed to understand how to explain to owners that needed to invest in different projects and how it would affect the bottom line. And also that I would need to get people that worked with me on my side for them to understand that what we were doing was going to make a very big impact on the guest experience. All those things, I wish I could have had some sort of class handbook that I could have gone by to understand, but it took me time. Um, I really learned on the ground by Googling, going to different conferences and events that I found to be very specific to other industries or very scientific. And again, just kind of gathering a little bit from everywhere and putting it all together, but doing something about it. Fast forward years later, at a different role in a different event in a different country, I actually met Dr. R. Benton and she showed me her green team course and I was impressed. And I said to her, I wish this existed when I started my journey because I would have gotten here a lot quicker. <laughs> it is extremely helpful. It's a great guide to understand how to manage people, how to gather data, how to speak the different language to different stakeholders when it comes to sustainability, and how to truly create smart goals towards implementing different initiatives and also continuum when it comes to the area of sustainability. I am very proud to say that years later after I graduated, actually I'll say exactly a decade later, I brought to my alma mater where I took my first class in sustainable tourism, and that was Florida International University. I brought the course that Dr. Aura Benton put together because I wanted to give back. I want to give future generations the opportunity to know what is available out there so they can get started now. We have no time to waste. Um, and those courses have run and many green teams have been built quickly and efficiently soon after. So thank you, um, Dr. Aurora Benton, for allowing me to share my story. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of your session. So, uh, Hello, students. It's sorry. Uh, so Deanna was working at FIU and she went to the academic team there and said, we should run this course. So it ran as an online course because it was perfect for working adults who are already working. They're already in a company. So we don't have to go out and find companies where they're going to start green teams. The course has run a few times now and more than 120 real green teams have started, mostly in Florida, but some of the students were outside of the Florida area when this course was running. The course requires students to launch a real green team. So let's talk a little bit more about what that experience is. You know, and, and I will say just one more caveat, the kind of background on this. I find that in my work, so I've worked, you know, I've been a, spent about a decade in higher education, work with a lot of students. And I love being in higher education and mentoring and encouraging students. I set a high bar. I'm that professor that's tough but it's tough love. And I love making my students feel capable and worthy of the careers they aspire to and, and believing in themselves. 
And what I found so often is there's a lot of myths about what it takes to be, have a career in sustainability. And one is that it, that it requires a degree in environmental sciences or another specific study. That does help, of course. Um, it could set you apart depending on what point of your career you're in. But there are other ways to learn the topics. If you are focusing on marketing or project management or other di business disciplines or other disciplines outside that, even art or philosophy, you bring talents and skills and experiences, and you can learn things like greenhouse gas emissions. You can learn all the other things that you need to be able to do to do your work. Um, I also think that there's this myth that sustainability jobs require a title with sustainability or a role in the sustainability department. I firmly believe that sustainability should be embedded in every department and maybe even every role. And so I'm really wanting to encourage students, look at right where you are. I'm not asking you to go out and try to get a job in a different department. I want you to start right there with your span of control, what you're able to do, and you're going to do something about sustainability. And I also find that a lot of times there's this idea that like, I don't get to be a part of anything related to sustainability in my company because I don't have permission. It seems like it's this elite off over there thing that I'm not allowed to touch or be a part of. And unfortunately, too many professionals in sustainability have created an elite bubble around what they do. And my goal is to burst that bubble because I want to democratize the experience and the work of sustainability. It doesn't just belong to some elite, specially educated people. And I get the temptation if you're one of those people to want to do that. You want to protect your career, protect your job, but there's enough to go around and we need everybody doing this work. And businesses really need to pay attention to this because study after study after study shows that the college age generation wants purpose-driven work. But studies also show that there's little actual implementation for them to sort of sink their teeth into. Um, and the problem is that they notice, you notice college students, younger people, they see that disconnect. Hey, the website says this, but... Um, I'm not seeing, not only am I not seeing that, I see the opposite of that. So this doesn't feel authentic to me. I'm going to go somewhere else, right? So this is a retention issue. And like I said before, a lot of students are waiting for permission and a clearly defined career path that just doesn't exist in most companies. And most of these students are not Greta's. They're not the people who are going to like barge their way through the world and, and, and make that happen. Now, probably a lot of you are because you show up to a call like this and you've joined something like this, but most students, the average student, they're not going to raise their hand and stick themselves out like that. And, but if they are given a little bit of guidance and just a little bit of opportunity, they will blow you away. They will do amazing things. And that's what this course was really about. So a case in point is one of the students who was in this course she worked in a lead building. You probably mostly know what this is. Most of you on this call, it's leadership and energy and environmental design. It's a special certification for buildings that are sustainable. She was working in a lead building. She'd been working there for four years. She had no idea what lead meant. No one in the company had ever said, here's how special that is. Here's what that means. And um, what she was noticing is that uh, in this management company that had this and other buildings, she noticed that none of them had a sustainability plan. There were no green teams in any of these buildings. And so she saw an opportunity for thought leadership because other buildings were actually coming to her and saying, hey, how are you guys handling like these trash bin things or your elevators or other things related to sustainability? And she really wanted to, I mean, this is probably what, four years ago, she really wanted to have some um, electric vehicle charging stations installed for the residents. And she went and, and did all the research and made a business case to the board and they installed EVCs as a result of her work. This is a student working in an entry-level job, not an executive, right? Not anyone with power or authority, but this is what she made happen at her building. 
The course really empowers and equips participants to take action and ownership, right? To really take the ownership and really believe in themselves in new ways. So one, I remember one student, she was on an internship in Italy, working for a hotel in a foreign country, and she started a green team there. Now that's impressive. And it really showed her that she was able to do things that she didn't even realize. And that to me is like, that's sort of like my heart goes pitter patter. I love that. Um, and again, leadership development, because these are lower level students realizing that they do have the capacity to drive change. Um, and so one student, she was talking about trying to get other coworkers to join in because, you know, people are kind of resistant. Does this mean more work? What are you asking me? And she said that they could see the vision. Um, you know, if they can see the vision, I was telling them, the student, like cast a vision for what the green team is. Don't go and say, show up to meetings do extra work, cast a vision for what you're trying to achieve. And she was saying that basically that not all of, the, all of them felt passion at first, but they could see the vision and then they will like, it will come along, right? And so she was really proud and moved to be part of something like that and to lead that. Now the course outcomes, because I can't control what these companies allow students to do, all I told them was you have to form a team and a team can be two people. You know someone else at work who will, who you can go up to and say, my grade depends on this. Please be on my team at the very least, right? You can do that. Set goals. You don't have to actually achieve them. You just have to set them. Design activities. You don't actually have to do them. You just have to design them. Overcome challenges, which means really just planning on what, how you're going to overcome apathy, inertia, turnover, things like that. And then measure and articulate the benefits. Really, it's more like the plan for how you would measure. So the teams that ran from the from the course in the at the college ranged from two to eighteen. The really large team was for a, a festival and running in California. And the staff was volunteers from around the country that were all meeting virtually and doing virtual trainings and communication leading up to being at the actual festival. Now. The students did not have to do any initiatives, but here are just some of the things that students actually did while in this class. I, I was so impressed and so proud of the things that, that students were able to accomplish and no thing was too small. Anything they were willing to try, experiment with and address was a reason enough to give them encouragement and and uh, you know give them a little guidance on some of these, especially on the topics that I know well, right? Because a lot of them were in hospitality because this was run out of the hospitality program. Although we had people from other programs take the course because it you know it appealed to them, um, so I knew a lot about how to guide them specifically. But a lot of it is just about showing them how to research, right? Like I don't know what food donation is like in your area. Let's look it up together. Here's how I do it open up Google. Here's what you type into Google. So some of the things that students got out of this course, um, really just a feeling of like being able to, to align their values with their careers. And I could really see how students were making a clear connection between what a company's mission is and the, the and sustainability. In other words, the sustainability might not be part of the stated mission of a company, but they could start connecting dots with like, well, if this is our mission, this is how sustainability supports that mission or enhances that mission. And it allows us to live out our brand and values. Now, as I said earlier, I really focused on asking students to look at data. And I don't mean complex, like super complicated, difficult to deal with data. This can actually be, you can start very small and very easy and very analog, even if you have to, with your data. So an example was one student who worked at a retail shop in a hotel brand that's one of the most sustainable hotel brands in the world in terms of just like how forward they are with sustainability and their branding. She worked in the, in the retail shop. She did an informal survey of 200, more than 250 customers just asking them as they checked out and keeping a little clipboard with a tally if they would be okay with email receipts. And 80% of them said yes. So she just took the paper out of the printer. <laughs> I love that, right? 
Um, she also did an informal survey and found that 53 customers in one week opted out of buying one of the products that was made of plastic. Once they found out it was made of plastic, they were like, oh, no, I don't want this product. That was more than $5,000 lost in sales in one week. She had this, there was this particular process they had to do with plants, the way they, they constructed something they did out of plants. And they used a lot of paper towels in that process. Well, she redesigned that process to eliminate or, or drastically reduce the usage of paper towels, which saved $700 a year in paper towels. Um, then also they, they sold a sunscreen at this store. And she noticed that the sunscreen would come in a box inside of a box. But they didn't display the box on the counter. They displayed, displayed the tube. The box didn't have branding. So it was a box inside of a box. She reached out to the vendor and said, hey, can we eliminate the extra box? And they did. So not only is that a win for her and that store, it was a win for the vendor. And then another student, just to give you another example of just like low hanging fruit, small little things that add up. This student was at a very small nonprofit and she convinced the employees to switch to reusable water bottles. And she showed them because they were really resistant, like, oh, why does it matter? And so she showed them the math and they were like, oh, okay, we get it, got it. Um, again, starting small, just, to, you know, encouraging the, the students to just really start with little things that they notice and little things that sometimes just fly under the radar, just things that people, people think you got to do, like, we got to change 300 toilets in the bathroom for it to move the needle. You can really move the needle, especially in corporate culture with doing these really small things. Of course, this really builds teamwork and communication. I loved how many students would tell me that they met co-workers they had never met before. They met people in departments they had never interacted with. And that is really fantastic. That's a great thing to go on the resume and really build up your, your experience and your uh, skills. Another thing is they felt like I, I'm not alone in this. They went into this feeling like I'm the only one in this company that cares about this. And then once they started socializing the idea, they realized, oh my gosh, a lot of people actually care about this. And, and we did actually run this one, uh, one and a half times, I'll say, uh, in, during COVID. And so it made it brought up extra challenges, but we really talked about the idea of how important it is to accommodate a variety of schedules and locations and other challenges that prevent people from meeting to still bring people together. And of course, this is just a real career building opportunity. Um, this one student was a, a, a worker in a hotel and he really wanted to be part of the management training program. He was really trying to get noticed. And so he he created these signs and put them around the breakfast buffet. He started you know, noticing the trash and paying attention. He implemented, he contacted a local waste management company and implemented a recycling program. And so like, that's the kind of thing that gets you noticed by by managers it gets gets you favor when you're trying to grow and advance in a career um i heard this kind of comment a lot remember i said earlier go with an assignment and they're not likely to say no so the students would go up to their bosses or a gm or someone and say oh my class says i have to start a green team can i do it okay whatever go ahead do your thing right so they don't really know they don't really care just whatever do that just just don't like let it interfere with your work but then once the, the students started, once the team started meeting and once they started planning things and once they started changing things and once they gathered momentum, all of a sudden the bosses are like, wait a minute, what's this? Doing? <laughs> wait a minute, this is actually really important. And so I actually heard this a number of times from students. And again, what a great way to be noticed for your leadership skills, as well as moving the needle in some sort of environmental or social uh, endeavor. And then last but not least is a really long quote. So I'll, if you want to kind of multitask, you can read this while I'm talking about this. So I do a lot of work with the World Wildlife Fund. I've done, uh, I'm going on my fourth major project with them this year in food waste reduction. And um, so just, you know, have a, a long history with them over the last five years of doing this work. And a few months ago, I um, got, they were like, oh, welcome this new member of our team. And I was like, Okay, I know Erica Gonzalez is kind of like a common name, but 
is this the Erica that was in my class? And sure enough, this was the Erica that had taken my class at FIU uh, three years ago. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I get chills even now just thinking about it because she was not going for a career in sustainability. Through her university experiences, she was getting a degree in hospitality. And through her university experiences, she really um, became, you know, came to love aspects of sustainability. She got to be involved, not only my class, but there's one other really great class, a professor there um, at, at FIU who does just really amazing uh, and, and experiential things for the students. Like he has a whole group that goes and works the Food and Wine Festival and things like that in Miami and really focusing on sustainability. So she got to be part of these things and really, uh, it, it really redefined her career. And so I, I love what she says at the end here. Sustainability is an interdisciplinary field that involves a deep understanding of science. But what's even more important is project management and interpersonal relationships. Building trust with partners and teams to move the needle is essential. Again, at the end of the day, it's pretty easy to Google information around food loss and food waste. It is not easy to Google how to sell an idea, how to build trust how to engage stakeholders. These are things that take practice and take application, which is why I thoroughly and strongly believe that universities should have more coursework and experiences like this. Of course, internships are meant to be that, but I think it needs to be woven more into the coursework so that students have more opportunity to build the skills that really do differentiate them. And with that, um, I'm going to go look at the questions here. Um, if you, if anybody wants to unmute and ask questions, I'm going to go back. I know there was probably some questions here that I missed. So let me go back and try to read those. Um, and, and Hadley and, and Michelle, if there are any questions that really stood out to you that you want me to prioritize, um, just go ahead and let me know. Sure, we've been taking note of all the questions in the separate documents so we can go through them in that way. To start, one, the first question was actually came from me, so let's just start there actually. But I was wondering in general, since we have students working in a lot of different areas and they aren't necessarily in hospitality, um, although of course the things you touched apply mm -hmm. everywhere like waste and food, uh, what are some of the easiest areas in sustainability to find your it and make an impact when getting started yeah. versus what are some of the more challenging but worthwhile ones would you well, say? Well, actually, what I would say is, is how I chose my it, how I chose hospitality and sustainability, hospitality is I, because I had not worked. I never worked in a hotel, never worked in a restaurant. I did not have a background personally, like a lot of students, you know, work in that. I have worked in retail in my college and high school years. But as a consumer, my favorite industries, I, I'm a, a, I travel a lot I'm a, and I'm a foodie. So it was narrowed down because I, I wanted to narrow it down to something that I already had a deep passion for. I don't really care about how sustainable pharmaceuticals are. I mean, I do, but I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in the sustainability of cars, really. I mean, yeah, I'm interested, but I chose something that I was deeply passionate about. And, and it's interesting because the moment that I really kind of had this like moment of like, yes, this is it. I was on a vacation. I was actually at a, a grad school reunion. I was walking through the hotel lobby and I was just like, I just love being in hotels. I mean, I've always been that way. I always love traveling. And it was just like this ah, moment where I was like, this is it. This is my it. I want to change the hospitality industry. And, and food manufacturing was a close second because I actually did my doctorate degree related to food manufacturing and social and environmental impact. So I feel like your it needs to be the it that really just drives your personal passion. If that's agriculture, great. If it's cars, great. If it's renewable energy, great. Whatever it is, it could be sports, whatever the thing is that you're super passionate about. If you also can kind of, or, or maybe you've just had some sort of life changing, you know, like I said, pharmaceuticals, maybe that's, you know, not for me, but maybe you've had some sort of life changing experience where pharmaceuticals like kept you alive or kept a loved one alive and you want to transform that industry, go for it. 
I feel like the it needs to be where your heart beats. Yeah, we, with our students, there's so many ways you can make an impact and there's so many areas you can tackle, but we think it's more sustainable personally, just like what you're saying to do what it is you care about because you're not going to get burnt out that way. You're going to be the most excited to get to work each day and put in the work and put in the time. Yeah, so, exactly. 100%. Uh, let's see, what question do you want me to go? So I, I see one person say, what was the student makeup of your course? It, it's interesting because I did develop this originally for the hotel industry, but over the course of the, of the time of running this, we had 20 different industries represented. And we had students ranging from, you know, like mostly it was sophomore or above because it wasn't really an entry level co course. Um, but we had students from, you know, who were running their green teams out of their, for, for their dorms or fraternities or something like that to um, director, like there was a director of HR for a hotel. So a more advanced career person. We had people in construction in, I mean, just, it just, you name it. We had, like I said, we had about 20 different industries that were ultimately represented in the, the course. And I see Jonathan, oh, sorry. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I see Jonathan just asked, um, how do you avoid greenwashing, especially in a time where sustainability seems to be um, it, the it thing, and then we'll go with a new after that. Yeah, so um, this is actually, it's funny that you say that because in the course, I, I the newer version of the course, I, I originally released this course in 2017 and I released a new version in 2021. And um, in the new version, one of the things I address is I talk about the business. This also kind of gets to um, Hadley's question about convincing businesses of economic benefit. There's actually a chapter on that, that, I, that I, I have three chapters on sort of like making the case for sustainability and a green team. And one is the fact that it's strategic. The other is the fact that it's popular and that it's actionable. And one of the cases that I make in there is the fact that when you have a green team and you have people dispersed throughout the organization who are watching and noticing, they're hopefully going to catch that greenwashing before it gets out into the world. So I think that's a real benefit of the, the green team, because if you have marketing people sitting in with operations people, sitting in with environmental people and all that's sitting together and marketing says, yeah, look at the new campaign we're doing. And someone from operations says, uh, excuse me? What, what are you out there telling the world we're doing? We don't do that. And that is the value of a green team because you don't necessarily have a lot of um, opportunities and companies for cross-functional meetings like this. But if you're having this cross-functional meeting and sustainability is the theme, then these things can kind of pop up and emerge and you can potentially reduce your risk by having that kind of cross-functional conversation. Excellent. Yeah, thank you so much. Such good feedback. And Anu, would you like to ask a quick question? If you can take yourself off mute. Hi there. Oh, Hi. thank you so much for the presentation. I feel like um, super lucky to attend and uh, such a privilege really to be here. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, that being said, um, you know, I'm a mid-career professional. It mm -hmm. seems like most here are like probably students uh, a little bit earlier on in their um, kind of experience sets. Um, I have a background in oil and gas, actually. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I like to throw that out there and just to get people's reactions. Um, but, you know, I'm very deliberately transitioning and signed mm -hmm. up for a sustainability course and um, am really looking to try to tell my story if you will, and kind of yeah. going back to your slide, um, which shows the progression, but kind of focusing on the it, if you will. And um, it seems like uh, the question has come up and you've addressed it, but I just wanted to get a little bit more into what is it? Like, what are we actually yeah, trying to answer is. here? Yeah. yeah. Um, and being in San Francisco, I've been really uh, like overwhelmed, honestly, because there's such a, a large playing ground mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to um, startups, mid-sized companies, large yeah. corporations. 
but also like, you know, kind of general corporate sustainability, uh, sustainability and consulting. Mm -hmm. But then there's also like this whole world of startups that, yeah. you know, provide all sorts of different, you know, products and services. Some of them are like robots that are helping, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, at, yeah, so, like so basically with, with all of that, how do you find yeah. it with all those different options? And the thing, exactly. is, the thing about the it is the it is not the end. The it is the starting point. So the it is the first step that you're taking on your journey or one of the earlier steps. It does not have to define or dictate where you end up. But when you start those first steps following things that are passion that you feel passionate about, that you feel aligned with you, that you feel an energy around, then you're going to get the next step and the next step and the next step. And then pretty soon you start to form the lane that you're meant to be in. Right now, it's like a 12 lane highway, right? You're like all over, you probably feel like you're all over the place. And that's okay. As long as you've got forward momentum, because a lot of times what Finding that it is, it's more a process of elimination. And I know that that's frustrating. I know it takes a lot of time. I have lived through it multiple career changes in my life. But I will promise you that if you will passionately step out one foot at a time with the things that resonate with you, that, that like keep you up at night or get you up in the morning, then the one step is going to lead to the next step. Show up to the events hear what people say, and think about some of those pros and cons, right? There's advantages to going to work for larger businesses where there's established sustainability teams and there's established career paths versus startups. It's sort of, you get to define your own way, but it's also very volatile because like I said, I've <laughs> lost many a job because the startup went out of business. Um, they also can be very, unfortunately, very mismanaged, very poorly managed. A lot of hype and excitement and money gets thrown at them, but you don't have the right people with the right ethics and the right values and the right business sense to keep it going. And so you kind of have to really just be watching, be careful about that. Um, but I would say, don't, don't put too much pressure on yourself to immediately know the it. Just, just follow the first sense of passion and let that take you somewhere else. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, would you have anything to say around those um, those kind of pressures that are very human? And so, like, I'll I'll even find myself applying to an oil and gas company <laughs> and just being like, "Hey, is it me being out of work so long? You know Why I'm not okay, getting so... any reactions?" Well, and then I, I realize, like, that... even if I got a job. Like, what would I do with that offer? I would be so unhappy taking it. Like, it seems well, like a total I, I will, waste of effort. But I will also say that um, I really resist this idea that there's like this sort of good and evil, you know, there's almost like this sort of good and evil thinking around career choices when you're in sustainability. Mm -hmm. Because somebody has to work in oil and gas. It's not going away. I mean, yeah, it'd be great if we use less of it, but when we have this mentality about anything in the world as being all good or all bad, like the example that comes up a lot in food is this denial of red meat and everything has to be vegan and somehow that makes things more sustainable. That's not always true. If you have regenerative farming practices, livestock actually can heal soil, which is one of our greatest mechanisms for capturing carbon and people go in with a limited view of what right or wrong is or what good or bad is and I personally my brand values and what a strapto is about is very much about meeting people where they're at and trying to really resist it's not my natural tendency but I really daily exercise the resistance to sort of blame and shame and be critical and have sort of that scary sense of urgency and so if getting a job in oil and gas gives you a piece of the puzzle that you need, don't judge yourself for that and don't let others judge you for that just because it's oil and gas. That's what you know. That's how you're building a career. And that is how, what's going to open other doors for you if you start putting that energy out there and being present in things. Someone is going to need the skill set you have. 
It doesn't matter that you built that skill set in oil and gas. In fact, it will probably end up being the thing that differentiate, differentiates you when you need to go into some job where knowledge of that industry that you have is vital. So I would say that to, to everyone on the call, you know, whatever sort of career aspirations or industries you're thinking of, resist the temptation to point fingers at other people or to judge their choices because we need advocates and champions everywhere, everywhere in all industries. We need them in law enforcement. We need them in oil and gas. We need them in government. We need them in pharma. We need them everywhere. And so I think we have to be careful. And that's one of the things that's so great about, right? Like this whole interdisciplinary aspect of sustainability, that there needs to be a place for it in any kind of organization. Um, so I just want to uh, note the time um, here that we're a little bit after eight. I have a few more minutes. I'm happy to try to address more questions, Hadley and Michelle, if you'd like me to. Otherwise, um, I'll, I'll let you make the call on how long we should stay on here. Perfect. And yeah, thank you for all that perspective on a news question. I think that's very valuable advice too. Um, yeah, I think Monique asked, if it's hard to get that green team going immediately, how can you make the impact as a green solo leader? Yeah, yeah. You know what? This is what I deal with this a lot in the course because the course is kind of designed for that one person going, um, I'd like to try this. It's just, it feels like it's just me. And so I talk a lot about the fact that you need to just start um, paying attention to the things that others in your workplace are interested in that they may not see the direct tie into sustainability. Like the person who rides their bike to work, the person who brings their own lunch, the person who notices when something's thrown in the wrong, wrong recycle bin, those people are there. You just haven't had that conversation with them. They don't, they're not flying their sustainability flag, right? You don't necessarily notice that. But if you find some common ground in things like, you know, camping or interest in outdoors or somebody who's a foodie, you can start talking about like, oh, I, I just read this thing about regenerative farming. Like, did you know that blah, 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 right? It open, it, because it is all about relationships. It's all about relationships when you're first getting started. So you just got to be able to have those conversations. The other thing is people get really immediately concerned with like, what are you asking of me? What's in this for me? Be ready to answer the what's in it for me question. I, it's totally fair for anybody in an organization to say, what am I going to get out of this? What am I supposed to do? So you should be ready to answer the question, what's in it for the person who is thinking about um, you know, joining your team. And sorry, I just realized I could stop share and be more like uh, in inclusive. And in sorry, and I'm sitting in the dark now because it's 7 p.m. Or it's sorry, it's eight <laughs> it's after eight where I live. Um, and so um, just, just really focus on building those first few relationships. And then once that inertia happens and you start to get that momentum, others will kind of be like, hey, what's this thing you do? What's this, you know, and use food, use like other bribe them <laughs> if you have to with food or if you have at all the opportunity to, you know, convince leadership or decision makers to give people extra time on a break or something like that. Find ways for people to be like, okay, you, now you got my attention because it's not going to be the first priority for everyone the way it is for people who would show up to a call like this. So you have to, you know, to, this is why salesmanship, salesmanship is one of the top skill sets you can have in sustainability because you are selling yourself, you're selling an idea, you're selling a philosophy, you're selling values. So you need to be able to develop some salesmanship skills in that. Definitely. It's all so valuable to hear. And I know it is so late for you and we've already had so many questions. So I think that will be the last one. First of all, just thank you so much for joining us in the first place. And thank you for just all of your insight and your enthusiasm and for all the impact you've made in so many industries and on so many students, as we've seen with those testimonials that you've brought up. And even in this call today, we have Cassandra in the chat saying, thank you so much. This is life-changing to hear and you're truly an inspiration. So it makes me very happy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah, we, I think we're all thinking it and there are some longer messages in the chat as well. So maybe you can check those out, but 
yeah, our students are so happy to hear this. And this has been such an honor to have you join us. And just as a reminder, this presentation is a part of an ongoing webinar series hosted by the University Climate Ambassador Program at the Global Climate Pledge. So if you are a student who is not with us and found us through Eventbrite or something else, and you're interested in making an impact on campus and contributing a few hours per week to starting a green team in your Greek life chapter, which we have someone here who started a green team in her chapter, or impacting waste or dining or anything at all, and want to be a part of a group working towards something bigger and consolidating resources resources and creating these templates like Aurora is talking about, you're welcome to reach out via some of the links in the chat or reply to one of those emails from Eventbrite that led you to the Zoom link today. So thank you all very much for joining us. And I would love to keep in contact with any of you who I don't already know prior to this call regarding how we can work together towards a green future. So thank you all. And thank you, Dr. Benton. And have a great night, everyone. Thank you.